Welcome to ETN Talks. I am Oyan from Energy Tech Meetup, and today we have James Sprint with us, who is Vice President of Strategy at Energy Impact Partners. Hi, James. How are you doing today? I'm well, thanks. How are you? Good. Thank you. So thank you very much for joining me today. And since we have limited amount of time, let's just dive into our questions. So Great. first of all, would you tell us a little bit about Energy Impact Partners? Sure. Um, so Energy Impact Partners is a clean energy investment firm based in the US and Europe. We have about 1.5 billion of assets under management, um, primarily focused on venture and growth equity, but also in credit and infrastructure. On the venture side, we invest in startups supporting the transition towards the zero carbon energy system and economy. And one of the unique things about EIP is that the majority of our investors are strategic. So primarily utilities, but also energy, transport and industrial companies from across the world. And what we aim to do is invest in companies where our partners can really support those businesses either by actually doing direct business with them um, and providing revenues or in directly through their expertise and industry contacts. And so out of our 50 employees that we have globally, about a third of them are actually outside of our deal teams and are really focused on that strategic angle. So that's either directly helping the portfolio with business development efforts um, or providing in-depth research and analysis on the markets and technologies we invest in. I see. So now you work in Germany, right? And yeah, what, I'm based in Cologne. So what trends do you see in European energy and clean tech industry? Sure. Um, so I think we're kind of at a turning point in Europe and to some extent globally. Um, much of the attention of certainly policymakers, but I think as a result, companies and investors over the last one to two decades has really been on decarbonizing um, the power mix. So basically deploying as much wind and solar um, as possible and, and kind of financing those efforts. Recently, you know, over the last three to five years, I think there's been more attention on, well, how do we actually make that power system with all these new technologies run effectively? And that's given an opportunity, technologies like batteries or flexibility platforms. And I think really we're gonna see more of a push in that area. But the big change now is that there's actually much more attention on, on sectors outside of just power um, and looking at how we can decarbonize the rest of the economy. and transport is a really obvious candidate um you know electric vehicles really picking up steam or at least were before covid hit um but also heat buildings and you can really see with the kind of discussions that are happening at a policy level particularly somewhere like the eu with the post-covid stimulus there's going to be a lot of attention directed towards those um areas and that's going to give an opportunity over the next decade i think for technologies like heat pumps to really gain commercial traction that's already starting to happen and then maybe slight things that are slightly further out like hydrogen long duration storage um, I think are going to have quite strong prospects over the next decade so that's some of the things we're starting to look at. So I think many startups are watching this our video and I think they are probably wondering what type of startup do you invest in and what would you like to see in them? Sure. Um, so I'll highlight three sectors in particular and then maybe talk about um, what we more generally like to see as well. Um, so e-mobility e or elect electric transport um, is a very important topic to us and it's quite a broad area where there's lots of different angles you can take when it comes to investment and, and businesses to support. Um, in Europe, we think Kind of the public charging opportunity has um, not exactly been played out, but it's not so attractive to us anymore. It's a highly fragmented market. There's a lot of different players, but there's other angles there that are interesting to take. So 
um, something around vehicle to home, vehicle to grid. We've been actually been seeing a few companies coming to market recently. I'm still unsure of you know what I think the future prospects of that are, but I think it's an interesting area and the timing might be right now to, to do something in there. Another area we've been looking at quite closely is um, battery analytics software. So, um, you know, if there's going to be millions of vehicles on the road and a large portion of the, um, the cost of those vehicles and an incredibly critical part of the battery, understanding how the battery is performing and the health of it and how charging affects that is very important. So we're seeing a lot of interesting innovations around um, technologies to kind of monitor and improve the health of batteries. So that's something we're interested in. Um, and then, of course, there's, there's other aspects around fleet electrification for vehicles. So generally, e-mobility is, is a really attractive area to us. Another completely different area is um, what I guess I would call remote monitoring of um, both infrastructure, but also kind of natural assets. Um, I think because of the kind of amazing innovations around um, Earth observation, geospatial data, with kind of both incredible number of satellites being launched and new types of satellites being launched at very low cost there's really a wealth of data that didn't exist a few years ago and and a lot of companies have been developing kind of specialized data platforms to take in all of that geospatial and earth observation data and convert it into interesting insights so the applications are very wide ranging all the way from monitoring utility infrastructure um, to tracking emissions such as methane uh, in pipelines and things like that, and all the way to kind of verifying uh, a supply chain for a business. So I think that's quite a broad area um, where there's a lot of innovation um, that we're interested in. And then finally, another area I'd highlight is um, what I broadly call kind of decarbonization services for corporates. Um, and you know this really ranges from everything like helping a, a business structure a power purchase agreement with a, a, a renewables project developer if they're trying to make um, clean energy purchases to helping them verify and clean up their supply chain um, to even things we've seen um, recently and from a couple of our partners as well of helping businesses um, kind of make their uh, mobility um, for their the commute for their employees um, carbon free so providing kind of a comprehensive end to end solution that ranges from um, public transport to scooters to electric vehicles that ensure their employees are able to, to get to work in a low carbon way so all of those are we think are quite interesting areas that are um, that are going to really develop over the next couple of years um, so that's a couple of topics. There's definitely more we look at. And then kind of more generally in terms of what we like to see in a company, um, certainly decent commercial traction in terms of the stage that we're investing at. Um, it's usually Series B, so we want to see you know, um, several million in, in, in revenue and, and that the company's at a kind of inflection point and really starting to take off. We also care a lot about capital efficiency. Um, and, and understanding that the company has a strong track record of, of using its um, investors' money uh, wisely, especially as, you know, historically, a lot of the areas we look at within kind of clean tech um, and scaling can be slower than expected. So you need to be kind of um, making sure you're using your funds in, in the right way uh, appropriately. Thank you so much. That was quite broad. And the last point was quite interesting about helping to cooperate. I just realized I see like the innovations going on in energy quite narrow. Yeah. So going to our next question. In our last event, you mentioned that majority of the investors at EIP are uh, utilities and energy companies. And you also mentioned it today. And I wonder what benefit do they really gain from investing in and cooperating with those energy startups? And I think this leads to a question that what is the strategy or change of business model of those incumbent utilities in this transitional period? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very good question. Um, and something people ask us a lot. I mean, I think there's a number of benefits that 
um, utilities or incumbents in an industry can gain from um, investing in startups. Uh, number one is kind of unique access to kind of insights that those companies are generating, often at kind of the cutting edge of um, of what's going on on in that sector. And you know when you're when you have a stake in the company and you're working with them that closely, you really understand kind of what what's going on, what's affecting them in a way that um, you're certainly not going to get if you're just a, a business partner with them. So that can be very, very valuable um, for incumbents who are trying to pivot into new sectors um, and, you know, are struggling to really understand what's going on in detail at kind of the cutting edge. You can also get a lot closer collaboration. I mean, it really depends on what the startup you're investing in is doing. If they're just selling a piece of hardware, it, it maybe it's not necessary. But if they're developing kind of um, maybe a, a new um, business model to service some of your customers and you're kind of partnering with them, potentially by investing in them, you can kind of cement a stronger uh, relationship that you wouldn't uh, have otherwise. And then finally, something that kind of a lot of our partners have, have mentioned to us before is actually the, the cultural change that can come along with it. And that by investing in those companies and feeling um, that you're kind of bought, well, you are literally bought into them, um, but that they might have buy-in with you for your own um, employees at the, at the utility or in the incumbent, there's kind of, um, you know, it really helps feed into the some, a sense of innovation and helps with the culture change that's necessary um, sometimes to transition to new areas. But a lot of that kind of thing can be quite high risk. Um, obviously, investing in, in startups, particularly for companies that are not used to, to doing that, which is why we think naturally that our model um, makes a lot of sense because, you know, the utilities investing in us get to invest in a whole um, range of different startups kind of indirectly. And so they get all of the benefits I described above without the risk of being directly tied to, to one startup. Um, and then, sorry, your second question was around um, kind of what, what some of the strategies around business change for the incumbents are. Yes, great. Yeah, I mean, I think um, we're seeing amongst our part partners like a really wide ar array of different things. Um, I think in, in Europe, what we see is that a lot of um, kind of players in the energy sector are trying to move um, towards more of kind of a, a, a service-based model. Um, a lot of them have been downsizing their of generation fleets, getting rid of, say, upstream assets that they might have had and trying to move, reposition themselves around kind of retail and services they can provide to both um, residential and, and business customers. Um, different model in, in the US, and I think there it's about kind of maybe incorporating the latest technologies um, in, in, in kind of more of the traditional business model that they have. Okay. Uh, let's change our topic a little bit. Previously, you led decentralized energy team at Bloomberg, right? And would you tell us uh, how decentralized energy is affecting energy industry? And how do you see its role in, let's say, 10 years? Sure. Um, yeah, so my, my former role, I was um, at Bloomberg NEF, Bloomberg Energy Finance, leading the decentralized energy analyst team. Um, and I think of decentralization conceptually in two ways. One is about um, kind of assets and infrastructure and um, w generally the power system is becoming more distributed. That's happening um, at different speeds and to different extents in different countries. Um, in some markets like Australia, there is an enormous amount of rooftop solar. There's likely to be quite a lot of um, uh, residential storage, commercial storage, et cetera. Um, in other markets, that's not gonna happen as much, but generally um, as we're deploying more wind and solar, those are more distributed than coal and gas, et cetera. So the, physical infrastructure that we're building is becoming more distributed and that means we need to think conceptually uh, in a different way about how we run the power system. It means we need 
um, slightly different technologies to run the power system. It means if you're kind of a trading team, your job is more complicated today because you're not now trading maybe hundreds of smaller assets rather than kind of uh, a handful of, of much larger ones. So that is kind of a big difference that I think, you know, we're able to address and there's technologies and operational changes to solve that. The other way I think about decentralization is more in terms of kind of power and control over um, who runs the, the energy system. You know, in the past, it, the, the energy system was very much run by large companies um, and to a large extent it, it, it still is. But I think we're seeing increasing amounts of kind of um, influence that individual actors, whether they're an actual person or, or a business are able to have over um, the power system. So for households or individuals, that means, you know, you can produce your own electricity with, with rooftop solar. That really changes the nature of your relationship with the energy supplier. Um, for businesses, there's now, kind of as I was touching on earlier, an incredible array of options um, for how they can um, consume power, how they use energy, um, how they conduct their op operations as it relates to kind of environmental um, attributes. And we're really seeing um, businesses, a lot of businesses make very, very strong commitments to go carbon free. And so there's going to be a lot of, you know, technologies and business models that benefit from that, from having um, a system that's kind of shaken up to an extent and where actually the control within it is slightly more distributed. But it also means that existing business models like the traditional model of energy supply also needs to change um, to reflect um, consumer preferences to a greater extent than it has done historically. Thank you. So personally, like I am little interested in like microgrid related research and in my opinion, development of microgrid is quite dependent on government subsidies like bidding tariff. And according to my recent uh, readings, I read that the feeding tariff has stopped in UK last year and in Germany it will stop next year. And in this post feeding tariff period, do you see any new business models for decentralized energy or microgrid? Yeah, I think. Uh, you're right. I mean, as subsidies are winding down, um, it obviously you then really need to reflect upon whether the, the business model is viable on its own. And I think there certainly are many business models that relate to microgrids or distributed assets that, that are viable um, and increasingly so. You know, the underlying technology costs, whether it's storage, solar, etc., have obviously come down dramatically over the last 10 to 20 years. Um, but I think it is gonna require people to be quite specific and focused about what exactly, what value they're bringing to customers. Um, I think over the last five years, there's kind of been a lot of distributed energy business models that are trying to do everything for everyone. And often they end up doing nothing for anyone. <laughs> um, so, they need to be more focused on, on, on what the aim is, but there's certainly already today, you know, you can find um, really interesting examples ranging from, you know, in the US, there's a lot of microgrids that are developed for resiliency reasons. Trying to calculate the economic value of resiliency is, is quite a challenging thing to do. Um, but let's say you can put a number on that, then maybe you can combine that with um, a slight saving on the energy bill and overall, it makes sense to you. Maybe you don't even need an energy saving because actually the value of the resiliency is enough. In other instances, um, there could be you know, a decarbonization or ESG benefit to the microgrid. So you're providing technologies that um, are more environmentally friendly. Um, and so therefore, you know, that, that's the value you're bringing. We even recently had a conversation with a, a, a really interesting, very early stage company um, in the Netherlands that is basically deploying um, storage in uh, apartment buildings just to avoid um, the peak demand uh, use, uh, energy use from the elevator. 
So it's a really specific application, literally just using the battery for, for, for the elevators, but it makes sense in that particular application. So I think today, a lot of the success is gonna come from really working out what exactly are, is the value you're providing and then really focusing on, on making sure you're bringing that to your customers. Thank you. So we're coming to the end of our interview. And lastly, do you have any message to the aspiring energy inter entrepreneurs watching us? Um, sure. I mean, yeah, I think it's really never been a better time to be a, a clean tech entrepreneur. Um, there is so much focus on decarbonizing the economy across almost every industry and every sector of the economy. Um, some of the largest businesses in the world, like Microsoft, um, other tech giants have incredible commitments to um, sustainability and, and clean energy. Um, the the post-COVID um, stim stimulus response in many countries is likely to have um, an environmental flavor to it. So I really think it's a great time um, to be coming up with innovations broadly in the clean tech space, not just within um, clean energy. So I would say keep at it and, and ride the wave of whatever um, green stimulus comes out over the course of this year. Great. Thank you very much, James. And thank, thank you, you to all those who checked out this video and hope you enjoyed it. To Great. stay tuned for more insights and event information, subscribe us and follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn. See you.